Ruth chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The Word of God says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the Bible says the names of their two sons were Malon and Kilion. Some versions have that spelled with a C-H. They were Ephrathites. The Bible says from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, who I always want to say Oprah, always, I can't help it. So if I do that today, just understand. And the other Ruth, after they had lived there for 10 years, for 10 years, both Malan and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for taking us into a new journey where we will have to be vulnerable, open up, introspective, all the things that can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. But Father, we ask you to do so with your Holy Spirit so that there may be growth. We trust our hearts in your hands. We ask you to do as you promised you would do. Convict us. Give us light. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was a famine in the land, and this was a very common practice that if your particular region, your country, was experiencing a famine, that people would avoid this famine by going to a friendly nearby country where they could ride out the famine, so to speak. Remember in our last series, Next New Now, that's exactly what the Shunammite woman had done based on the counsel that Elisha had given her. And so the Bible says that they go to a distant land and Moab wasn't always friendly towards Jerusalem, weren't always uh, favorable to the Israelites. There is some history there. I don't have time to get into that. But back, back, back in the day, there was connection. They shared the same ancestry. But the Bible tells us they went there in order to ride out the famine. And while they were there, the parents knew their sons were old enough to get married. Now, God was really big on this with his people about not intermarrying with other cultures and other religions. He says, do not be unequally yoked. And of course, we've taken that to another level. I don't want to get into some of our sad history, even within our denomination, when people had issues with other uh, 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 cultures coming together, uh, intermarrying, being in interracial relationships. It's a bigger thing when it comes to being with people of different faith and denominations. But back then when God did not want there to be inter intermarrying between uh, different uh, groups, it's because he knew it would compromise the mission he had his people on. Often when people would intermarry, they would dilute what they had been taught. They would take on some of the other traditions of other groups and civilizations. They would start some of their practices that God knew would be detrimental to his people. So he says, listen, I've set you apart. You are holy and you have a special mission. Now, now don't think for a second that God is an elitist. God set Israel apart for one purpose and one purpose alone, so that he could bless them and that they could bless all nations. That was always the purpose. And God knew that if they compromised that influence, they would be less effective in blessing the other nations. God never had a problem with people joining them. This is when they left, remember Egypt? There were many Egyptians that went along with them. Even when they went through the land of Cana, there were many people that joined them. Most, uh, most famously Rahab and all of her household. 
So God was never against Gentiles uh, mixing with his people, but they had to embrace the same principles. They had to have the same mission and vision. They had to love people and love their neighbor and not sacrifice their children to some war gods. They had to be able to see God is not this pagan God who's bloodthirsty, but they had to see him as a friend, as a father, as a savior. So this was really critical. But in times of famine, we often will throw away some of the things that we've learned. When we are going through a difficult time, when we are, when we, when we are struggling, when we are at a loss, or as Snickers likes to say it, when you are hungry, you're not yourself. They're hungry, and so they're desperate. So they go to live with the Moabites, and while they're there, the two sons marry two Moabite women, and tragedy hits Naomi and her family. The Bible tells us that she loses her husband, and in 10 years' time, she also loses her two sons. You have to understand this is such a critical loss. This isn't just losing people that you loved, people that you were attached to, but this is also losing your ability to live. Women did not work outside the home the way that men did. Women were taken care of by the muscle of men, their, their, their ability to work outside the home. This was like a death sentence, losing your covering, losing your husband, and losing your sons. And now she's all alone in a distant land. What would you do? The Bible tells us in verse 6 as we continue on, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. Let me just pause there for a second. It's interesting that the that the, 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 the city Bethlehem, the name actually means bread. In a town of bread, right, a city of bread, there was none at all. And so now she hears that the Lord has provided again for his people. And she and her daughters-in-law, they prepare to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you. It was really thoughtful of you to join me on this trip. And, but as I've been thinking about it a little bit more closely, it doesn't make sense for you to go with me, is what she says. Go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and she wept aloud and they said to her, we will go back with you and to your people. Boy, this, this flies in the face of some of our mother-in-law stories, doesn't it? They're so close to Naomi, so attached to Naomi, they do not want to leave her. We will go back to your homeland. We will be a part of your family. We're willing to put ourselves out there and be in a strange place because of our connection with you. Now, many of you know that in recent years, attachment theory, which now is more known as attachment science, has become all the craze. Everybody's talking about attachment. Attachment between couples, attachment between parents and children, and there's attachment styles. Now, there are many books, really good books, that are written on attachment styles. One of my favorite is Attached, and I'll show that just for some of you that may want to, to, to do some extra reading, two books that, um, that I've read recently, and one is Attached, and the other one is Attached to God. If we can show that real quickly, Sister Mavis. And so these two books have helped give me a, a, a window into this new science, this emerging science on attachment styles. Now, attachment styles, you have to understand, because this is this, this gone beyond theory but more science, 
depending on who you're reading, they have different labels. But I want to focus on, in this series, I want to focus on three. And there's sub-labels, sub-categories, but I don't want to get into that because this is not my field. I'm not a specialist. But I want to just draw your attention in generalities to some of the things that I believe uh, plague us. Here's one of the books, Attached to God by Crispin Mayfield. And this one, some of you probably have read this book, Attached, The New Science of Adult Attachment and How It Can Help You Find and Keep Love. But this series is going to focus on our attachment style as it relates more specifically to God. Because I believe that our attachment styles that we learned from our parents and we have practiced in our relationships actually can adversely affect the way in which we relate to God and how we believe he relates to us. In fact, if you have an attachment style that is avoidant or an attachment style that is uh, anxious or an attachment style that is secure, these are the three I want to focus on in the series, it will directly impact the way in which you relate to God and the way you believe he relates to you. Let's watch how, how this plays in this story. So far, we see that these two young ladies are attached to Naomi, right? You would say so, to the point where they would leave their family, leave their countrymen, and go to Bethlehem to follow her. She urges them to go back, and they said, we will go back with you and to your people. But the Bible says that we continue on in verse 11, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me. She's never been on eHarmony. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? This is pretty logical, right? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Bible says in verse 14, and at this they wept aloud again. Do they sound attached to you? Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. <laughs> she wept aloud again, and then she kissed her goodbye. But that wasn't the case for Ruth. The Bible says he, she clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Question, what happened to Orpah? Wasn't she attached? Did she see Naomi as a mother? Why would she then leave her all of a sudden? Attachment is a tricky thing. Not everybody attaches the same way. And when we're young, we learn attachment from our parents. I would like to propose that Orpa has an avoidant attachment style. Avoidant attachment style are those folk who deeply desire relationships. They want to be in relationship with somebody where it's meaningful. They want companionship, but they learned early on that being too vulnerable, being too emotional would not get their needs met. You want to see how this plays out? Remember when you were younger and you started crying and your parents said this to you? You want me to give you something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. Look at some of y'all just got triggered right now. I'm already crying. What do you mean you want to give me something to cry about? I clearly have something to cry about right now. I'll give you something to cry about. And what does that teach us as children? It is not safe to be emotional and honest with our feelings with our parents because they'll shut us down. They'll tell us what really should be important to be emotional about. But when you're young, everything is emotional. I remember crying because I woke up too late and couldn't watch Sesame Street. 
right? Kids don't, you don't know how good you have it today. You guys can just go back to Netflix or Hulu and watch it on demand. We wouldn't see it, the episode that we missed, for like another three months, right? I mean, this is how, this is how serious it is. So the Bible tells us that she is close and connected, but eventually just gives up and leaves. Avoidant attachment style, it, the person learns that if they are too emotional and too vulnerable, their parents may get overwhelmed and not want to deal with them at all. Parents, you know how that is sometimes when you just, you, you, you've reached your limit, you can't deal with it anymore, and your kids pick up on your body language, they pick up on your tone, and they know, I better not come to mom about this. Now, I grew up, I grew up as a middle child. I have middle child syndrome. I mean, no joke. I'm not even saying that to be funny. I, I mean, like, I straight up do. I think, I've, I think I'm recovering. I, I, I think I'm better. But as far back as I can go, my younger brother has always been there. I'm only 14 months younger than him. I had diapers on when I was first introduced to him. And then he had diapers on. And I remember as a young lad, I remember wanting my mother's attention and my mom often having to say, no, 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 this is your, this is your brother's time. This is your brother's time. And I remember when he would cry that his tears got more of a response than my tears because I had to be the big boy. At 14 months old. And my little brother, bless his heart, he was a mama's boy. He always wanted to be around mama. Always wanted to sleep with her. Always needed to be next to her. And I remember one time I said, Mom, I want to sleep with you too. I want to spend the night in your bed as well. Go sleep. My mom said, okay. So she put Greg in his bed, and I got to sleep next to mom. Oh, those first few minutes were so good. And then I knocked out. I woke up the next morning, ah, I love you, mama. But she wasn't around. I opened my eyes. I was in my, in my own bed again. I walked out of my room and I saw my mom's door closed. I looked in my little brother's room and he was not to be found. I opened the door, poked my head in, and sure enough, little Gregory was sleeping next to my mommy. watch this. I learned in order to get attention when I was younger, being the big boy, being the big brother is what gave me recognition. My little brother cried all the time, so I wasn't going to cry. And my parents would say, oh, John, you're such a good boy. You're so strong. Look at you. You're being such a good big brother, giving him your toys. So I just learned if he wanted my toys and he was going to cry about it, here you go, Greg. It's my Megatron. <laughs> I remember, I remember that I took that even to grade school. Even if I fell and got a really bad scrape, I was not going to cry. I was not going to cry. Absolutely not. And then when you become an adult, that whole middle child syndrome, learning how to mediate and please people and be the big boy turns into just raging codependency. I thought codependent people just needed people around just for their own benefit. No, codependent people, they see it as their purpose of meeting people's needs all the time. I was going to be the most dependable son for my father. Whatever he needed, whenever he asked, I would be there and I would give it to him. I was going to be the most responsible son for my mother. I was going to be the best little brother for my older brother, Bob. I was going to be the best big brother for Greg and later on, my other brother, Rafiq. And when I was at school, I always had to be the good kid. This is how I got recognized. And you're probably looking at me right now. Now I get it. Now I get it. That's why you became a pastor. Maybe. I really don't know because I, I, I've been doing this for so long and, and to have somebody who is a pleaser as a pastor is recipe for burnout. 
I spent 12 years in Oakland. I was 26 years, 26 years old when I started, when I had my first church. And there's only about 25 people showing up. And the conference told me, we'll, we'll, we'll give you res responsibility of this church, but in two years, we're going to look and see where you are. If the church has not grown, we're going to sell the church, and we're going we're to make you an associate pastor somewhere else. Two years to grow a church that had not grown in 20 plus years. The Grand Avenue Church used to be the conference church. It used to be like this church. It was a legacy church when the conference was still in Oakland, California. But then folk back then started leaving the cities like Oakland. We don't want to talk about why. The conference moved to Pleasant Hill and, and, and the churches in Oakland began to suffer for it. And, and Grand Avenue, the church that had such a great, glorious legacy, now was just hanging by limbs, and, uh, uh, by a limb. And, 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 and it looked impossible to grow that church. But in four years, we went from 25 to 400 people. Now you'll say, oh, pastor, man, God was really with you. I'll say yes. But I will tell you now, I worked in a in an in a, in a irresponsible way, in a way that could never be sustainable. Anytime somebody called, I was there. Sister Caraway, Lord rest her precious soul, blessed, used to call me up and tell me, Pastor, I'm trying to record two programs. I have two VCRs. I don't know how to do it. Can you come over and help? Sure, Sister Caraway. Sister Caraway would call me up and say, so, Pastor Henderson, uh, um, I, I can't find something. It's in a room. I got too many boxes. Can you come and help me search for it? Yes, Sister Caraway. Pastor Henderson, I want to set up my new microwave, but I want to keep the old one as well. I mean, I, it didn't matter what she called me for. I remember a couple that wanted me to counsel with them, and they could not meet in the evenings. So they asked, will you show up at 5 in the morning and go through this counseling session with us? And I agreed to it. Now, what I should have told him, if you don't care about your relationship enough, I'm sure not going to. You need to make it a priority. But here I was, I needed to be that yes person. And because I did not understand that even God has boundaries, let me say that again. Because I didn't understand that even God has boundaries, I thought that being like God, being like Jesus, meant I was always saying yes when people had needs. By year 12, I had hit a wall. I called the conference. I said, I said, you have to get me out of here. I had told them even a year and a half before then. They said, but you're doing so well there. We don't want to move you quite yet. Let's see if we can make some adjustments. But a year and a half later, I was done. I'm telling you right now, in some ways, it's a miracle that I'm still a pastor because I didn't think I would ever be a pastor again. Pastor Mark Wittes knows this because my next stop was a chaplain to be the chaplain at PUC. And he says, man, I don't know how you're going to make it here. You know, I preach most Sabbaths. I said, I said Pastor Mark, I don't want to preach. I just want to be able to sit in the pews. I just want to be a regular person. I have no desire. And I would sit and listen to him almost every single Sabbath. I remember one time accidentally walking into a nominating committee and I had PTSD. But it was at PUC that I began to reorganize my life and create boundaries that I now can say are sustainable. Where I can now say to people, I am not Jesus. I can't be there for everyone all the time. But that was hard. People like me will get into relationships and because avoidant attachment does mean that you actually want connection. It's just that if you're too emotional, you're too vulnerable, people will do this to you. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't give me that. that. What is that? So avoidant people have to find that balance of being good enough, being authentic enough, but not too much that you might get rejected. So you get married. And what's great is avoidant people, because of their attachment style, they're really low maintenance. Very independent people, right? I want to just share with you some of the characteristics of avoided folk. 
if you guys can roll with me. Avoidant folk, they value their strength. They're strong people. You may need my help, but I don't need yours. Right? Maybe if you can put that one up. I'm going to let you guys see some of this. They pride themselves on their strength. Another characteristic is that they're inauthentic when it comes to their security. They like to say they're secure people, but we're actually very insecure. We have to please you because it's the only way that we'll know our worth and our value. If you don't like us, then we don't have value. Can you imagine being a pastor and needing everyone to like you? Some of you are now going, oh, I get it. I get it now, pastor. They're hyper-independent in their relationships. There's nothing wrong with being independent, but hyper-independence is destructive to intimacy. No, 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 honey, I got it. I, no, 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 I'll, I'll do it. You stay. I'll take care of it. Right? They look and feel emotionally detached. They look and feel emotionally detached. A avoided people can fake like they're emotionally connected, but they're not really emotionally connected. They can hear people's problems, they can hear their issues, but they never will share their issues themselves. And in a relationship, again, it's destructive because people are looking for mirroring. They're looking for what I give and what I share. And when I'm vulnerable, I want to see the same level of vulnerability for you. But avoidant folk, they can't do that. They can't because being too vulnerable will mean somebody will say, come on, be a big boy. Be good, act right, be strong, be the good big brother, be the good pastor, be the strong husband. But there's some positive aspects to these folk. Some positive folk, some positive aspects is though they give very little in the area of emotional support, they require very little themselves. They're what we call low maintenance. Anybody like low maintenance people? <laughs> Man, people, people. People that are high maintenance, they'll stress you out. But low maintenance, oh, you don't even have to pour that much into her. She's, man, she's solid. I only have to tell her she's pretty like once every three months. They're very low maintenance. They require very little emotional support uh, themselves, but they also give very little emotional support. And here's the other part. And we'll, we'll stop on this. They're doers and they're fixers. They're doers and they're fixers. Though this may not be their primary love language to receive, they'll all, they're all about acts of service because it does not involve sharing emotionally. It doesn't involve them sharing emotionally. Those are like your deacons in the church. Those type of folk that just, you tell me what I got to do. What do I got to lock up? What I need to turn on. You tell me, Pastor. I'll, I'll pick up. You want me to do what? I got it. I got it. Have you noticed that deacons all have like a certain kind of like stereotype almost? Even when we're selecting people for deacons, we're like, yeah, that guy. Doers. You want me to take that table? I'll do, no, no, I got it, Pastor. I got it. I got it. I'm good. Right? And, and you may be in a relationship with somebody where you want more quality time, you may want more physical touch, you may want more words of affirmation, but they're like, hey, but honey, I always fill up your car with gas. Right? I'm always taking out the trash. I show you I love you by what I do, but doing stuff is just who they are. It's easy, it's simple, and it does not require vulnerability. Now, you may think for a second that I'm, I'm being just negative on folk like this. There are positive, positive, positive attributes to these kinds of people because we do need some who are doers in the church. We do, new, do need people sometimes who are the doers in the family that won't say, I'm having a bad day, so I'm just going to sit on the couch and stare at the walls. You sometimes need those people that are like, you know what? I'm going to take my emotions, I'm going to put it on the shelf just for the next five hours. I'll pick them up later. Right now, I need to feed the kids. Right? The, pr 
problem is when this is the only way in which you attach and relate to people that it becomes destructive. Orpah, in this scenario, does express a certain devotion, a certain devotion to, to Naomi. It seems like she is connected, but once she starts to look at all the pragmatic reasons why she should go home, what does she do? Because avoidant people, they are logical and they are rational. It doesn't make sense for us to spend a whole weekend working on our relationship. Do you know how much this is going to cost? Can I be honest with you? These attachment styles are what we learn from our parents. But it doesn't mean it's the only way in which we can attach. For many of us, depending on the trauma in our lives, we may express several different types of attachment styles, depending on where we are in our life. Even though our default may be one in particular. Today, we're talking about avoidant. The problem is, is that when you have an avoidant attachment style, you also begin to see God in the same way. After Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden, what did God do? What did God do? He came to them. He didn't avoid connecting with them. He came to them in the cool of the day as he always had. And what was Adam and Eve's response to God showing up? This is when you need a caregiver to show up, especially when you fail, especially while you have your hand caught in the cookie jar. And children are often looking at their parents and saying, I know I messed up, what are you going to do to me? Am I not going to be your son anymore? Am I not going to be your daughter anymore? Does this mean I'm cut off? Does this mean I'm on a timeout for a long, long time? God comes to them in the cool of the day. Now watch this, watch this. Adam and Eve, what do they do when they hear him? They want to avoid connection at all costs. Now why did they want to avoid connection at all costs? What's their reason? When they finally call out to God and, and tell him that they're hiding, he says, why? Because we're naked and we're ashamed. Oh, avoided people, oh, the shame. We were naked and we were ashamed and we didn't want you to see it because we just know you're going to reject us. Now, where would they get the idea that God would reject them if they were naked? Does God have a manual that they read and says, when you sin, avoid God at all costs? I believe they learned it from the serpent. Because as soon as they fell, Guess who disappeared in their lives? The one they trusted. The one who says, if you take this fruit, your eyes will be open. Oh, girl, if you hook up with me, I'm telling you, you are going to get the best in life. And we fall for this game. We fall for people who, 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 who entice us and, and tempt us. And, 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 and they, 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 they're showing us all the things they can do for us. And we finally give into it. And as soon as we enter that relationship with them, they do what? Oh, there goes that avoidance again. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did this in order for you to like me. But now that I'm close to you, it just ah, it feels too close. Let me just... This song and dance. No, honey, don't go, don't go. I love you. I don't go, don't go. Oh, thank you so much for loving me. Okay, okay, ooh, no, 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 too close, too close. You go back and forth, back and forth. And Serpent does that. He, he, he shows up. He lets them know about who God is. He most likely tells them his story. Oh, I used to be an angel. But one day God looked at me funny. He was jealous of me. So he cast me down here. He made me look like a, a monster. But I'm telling you right now, I have wisdom. I have knowledge. If you only take this fruit, you will be like God. You'll be more than that. I'm telling you right now. But as soon as they fell, their new caregiver disappears. Their new lover disappears. 
And all the trauma of that, the trauma of failure, the trauma of breakup, the trauma of famine, the trauma of death. Oh, you abandoned me. You left me. Why did you die on me? Why did you die on me? You were supposed to be with me forever, and you died. You're not blaming cancer. You're blaming them. Mom and dad, why did you leave me? Why did you abandon us? You shouldn't have gotten a divorce. Why did you do this to us? That trauma begins to shape the way in which you relate with the world and the way in which you relate with one another and the way in which you relate with God. So here comes God. Adam and Eve, where are you? No, 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 no. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. We know. We've experienced some stuff here. Not everything you say can't, it can't, just can't be true because the serpent told us this and he's gone. And we're naked and we're left alone. God is not trying to avoid you. He's pursuing you. Like Ruth in this story, like Ruth in this story, she clings, she clings to Naomi. We're closing on this. We're closing on this. She clings to him, to her. Ruth replied in verse 16, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging. We'll talk about this next week. This will be for the anxious folks, those who have anxious attachment. I believe this is what Naomi has. She's a little bit controlling. Don't worry, I'm giving you a preview, that's all. She's a little bit controlling. She, no, girls, you just go back. Just leave your mama. Just leave. I'm just, I'm cursed. She later says, my name is Mara. I'm bitter. Don't call me Naomi. I'm just a bitter old woman. I can't do anything for you. I'm no good for you girls. Just leave me. Just leave me. Now, did Naomi really want her daughters to leave? Just go. Just go. You'll find something better. And Ruth says, no, mama. No, mama, I love you, and I want to be with you for the rest of my life. May God deal with me ever so severely if even death separates us. This almost sounds like some Romeo Juliet kind of stuff. But do you see what secure attachment looks like? I'm not letting you go. I have bonded with you, mama, but I'm not even your real mama. Oh, yes, you are. And my God is really not your God. Yes, he is. Everything that is you is now me now. I love you. I am connected and I will not let go. And I'm telling you right now, your God is not avoiding you. He does not have avoidment, avoided attachment disorder or anything like that. No, no, no. That is not his style. God clings to us and says, I will not let you go. Oh, as a hen gathers her chicks, that is how I want to gather you to me and hold you close to my bosom. We celebrated this last week. The, the cross was God clinging to you. I will not let go. I will not let go. I love you this much. I will not let go. I will not let go. And here we are with our anxious attachment and our avoidant attachment styles, and our, our fearful attachment styles. Uh, uh, we're insecure. No, God, leave us. And God says, I'm secure enough for both of us. I'm not letting go. And I'm so glad that Naomi finally realized she was never going to get rid of Ruth. So she says, okay, grab my suitcase. I don't even really have a home. That's okay, mama. I'm going to go with you wherever you go. If you're on the streets, mama, I'm going to be on the streets with you. Ruth, you're just too good to me. She finally gets to Bethlehem, and the people see her, and they're, oh, Naomi, Naomi, you're back. Don't call me Naomi. I'm, I'm Mara. I'm bitter. The Lord has dealt with me so harshly. I have nothing. 
And she says that with Ruth standing right next to her. Really, Mom? What we will later learn out in this series, in this series, oh, Naomi had everything. I know some of you are brokenhearted. You've been in relationships where you've been abandoned. I know some of you were raised in households with avoided parents. You're not sure if being vulnerable, being vulnerable with anybody will ever be safe and will ever give you what you want, the love that you so desperately want. And you've looked at God as that same type of parent that doesn't want you to be too emotional. Don't share too much. Just do. Just do as I say. Just obey me. Obey me and you'll get rewarded. I'm telling you right now, God, with all of your wounds, just says, come here. Come here. You're not going to give me something to cry about? No. No. Baby girl, come here. You're not going to push me away? Absolutely not. Come here. Come here. Come here. God is clinging to you right now. God, you see those who are standing. All of us with our avoidant and anxious attachments, our insecure attachment styles. And here you stand so securely in front of us, comfortable enough in your own skin, certain of your love and devotion to us. Your arms are open wide, and you're basically telling us over and over again, I'm secure enough, you can trust me. So we thank you, Father, for those arms that are secure, those arms, Jesus Christ, that were stretched on Calvary. Thank you for loving us that much. We don't want to go anywhere else but where you are. You will be our God, and your people will be our people, and not even death will separate us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, church family.